Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome. Uh, I'm going to start. Uh, this talk is a little long. Um, none, so I'm going to try to get it going. For those that don't know me, my name is Don Zickis. I'm a senior kernel engineer at Red Hat. I've been there a long time. Today I'm going to be talking about how we plug into the Red Hat kernel CI ecosystem, talk about um, what we're doing in this space and how we're uh, interacting with the upstream community on this stuff. So enjoy. Uh, so we're all here. We all know about the Linux kernel. We're familiar with it. Um, it's been around for a while. It's a, one of the biggest open source projects out there. Um, I think a lot of you know it gets released every 8 to 10 weeks. It's pretty fast. And on top of that, it's got 14,000 commits per release. I mean, that's, that's a pretty amazing stat if you think about it, right? I mean, that's a lot of... A lot of change going on, and it's, you know, it's community tested and everything, and it, despite its rapid uh, release and, ra and the volume of commits, it still delivers a pretty high quality product. I mean, think about it, you can take a release kernel, put it on your laptop and it boots, and you, you get, it pretty much uh, works out of the box, you get all the features you need, which is impressive for the, the volume of change that's going on. However, it's, it's not quite good enough. I mean, if you talk to all the downstream distros that consume the Linux kernel, there's still a bunch of quirks, a little missing features here and there, some features not quite stabilized, so they have to spend time debugging it, fixing it, and uh, trying to push changes upstream to the point where they created this, uh, this project called Linux Stable to kind of aggregate all the, the distro's efforts and, and put the changes in one spot so everybody can some benefit, which is it's a good step. It's a good step forward. It helps out the community. But if you look at the stats there, they're still doing 50 to 200 commits per release, and those releases are happening in, in Linux stable every few days. I mean, which is great, that's what you want, but at the same time, that's still a, a high volume of change going on. Um, to the point where like, you, uh, you start to wonder, is this enough? I mean, is this enough? To, I mean, if there's that much change going on, things quite aren't as stable as they should be. And that's what you hear a lot about downstream, is that the Linux stable tree isn't quite there yet. We need to do more, we need to do better. So all this change in, in stabil stabilization kind of exposes a bunch of problems that I'm going to be focusing on today. I've got three right here that I, I want to talk about. Uh, the first one is you know, fixing an issue after a change is committed is expensive. And what I mean by that is uh, you, you do a change, and you, you commit it, and then uh, the downstream distros get it, and they find out it didn't quite work. Now, they've got to spend time trying to debug it and fix it, and not all these downstream distros, like, Fedora, SUSE, Ubuntu, Yocto, RHEL, et cetera, necessarily have all the manpower or the, or the time or the resources to fix this stuff. So th that's kind of a challenge. And then on top of that, when they do find it, they narrow it down to a change that happened. Working with the upstream community two to three months later after the change was, was released, it's hard to engage that developer. So that delay right there is a problem. So really, how you want to solve that is you want to shorten that feedback loop. You really want to attack the chain right before it gets committed um, to kind of reduce this burden on, um, say, the downstream distros. The second issue uh, I want to talk about today is detecting a change that doesn't regress without a test is hard. What do I mean by that? Uh, what do I mean by that? So when you, when you push a change up there, I mean, it, it fixes the problem in the moment. Uh, and then... 14,000 commits later, all of a sudden, it's broken subtly. And without a test to verify that it hasn't broken in a small way, it's difficult. You just, that change all of a sudden breaks two or three releases later, and no one notices it until it propagates down to the downstream distro and everyone complains. So what, the, what a lot of the community has done is uh, usually provide tests when you uh, incorporate the change. But with the kernel community, it's a little bit challenging incorporating tests for every change you provide upstream. And a lot of that is not necessarily the community's fault, but it's, it's provide, there's no easy avenue to provide a test. You know, either contributing a test or figuring out what test suites to run, or even having the hardware to run those test suites. So we need to build an ecosystem that kind of makes it easier to contribute tests that go along with the change so we can make sure we don't regress um, this high volume of change. And the third thing I want to talk about today is Running community tests on new hardware in a private lab is challenging. Um, one of the big things Kernel does is it sits on, uh, it, it lights up hardware. I mean, that's kind of its job. 
And so a lot of new hardware enablement happens. And so these, these companies that develop software to in, light up their hardware, they push the changes upstream. And they do the best they can with, with the test suites they have. But they don't have all the, the test suites that all the downstream distributions um, have and various uh, labs that all the other companies have. So it, it's not quite as stable. And so it usually you have to wait for the hardware enabling to go upstream. It propagates downstream. And then the downstream distos, they, they work on their stabilization. And then it push this changes back upstream. And usually it takes about two to three releases for this hardware to stabilize. It gets there, it's good, but do we really want to wait two to three releases? You know, could we do better? Could we try to focus it uh, on the first release? And, and to solve that problem, we really need to figure out a way to engage these hardware labs by giving them the test suites they need that everyone else is using, and getting them more involved in how the dist downstream distributions are testing um, and using their hardware and stuff like that. Um, so that's some of the challenges we want to face, and that's what, these are the challenges I want to talk about today. So let's dive in. Or uh, actually, first, here's kind of a this is kind of a high-level overview, but uh, this is kind of the, the flow of the, the ecosystem we're looking to do. We start out with the uh, so I'm actually let me take a step back. Red Hat's going to talk about an ecosystem, a CI workflow that we want to incorporate today. So that's that's where I'm driving, and, and the ecosystem we want to talk about is this: where you have a maintainer, kind of pushing out change to a CI system which detects what tests to run, runs it on a whole bunch of labs, gets the feedback, and if it passes, push it on upstream to Linus's uh, main uh, Linux tree. So that's kind of the model we're working on in the ecosystem there, but uh, so the question really is, how do you build that, or how do you enhance what's already there in the community? So we we'll would start at the bottom. Uh, you know, I got a bunch of pieces to this ecosystem here, and we're gonna start at the bottom with hardware. First thing you need to do in the ecosystem is is test the kernel on hardware, right? So that means you need a lab full of machines. Well, how do you get run tests on all these machines? You don't want to do it manually, so you need a, you need a service that manages these machines, these, a service that can control, tell you what machines you want to use, what machines, uh, which kernel can go where, and how to, how to run uh, automated tests. What Red Hat's been using for over 10 years is a, a service called Beaker. It's open source. It's been out, in the, uh, been out there for a while. Uh, and what this does is it, it, it's, it's an amazing piece of software. It, it basically provides you remote console, remote power, uh, a, a database of all the machines, uh, custom Kistark, allows you to do reservation uh, on the service. And uh, it really allows a developer to dive in, grab a machine, run, its, run tests, and debug it if need be. And uh, it kind of, I guess it, is the, the, the basic building block of doing uh, kernel testing for RHEL, at least. So I got a couple slides kind of showing the power of Beaker. These are, these are web pages off the Beaker. So just to give people an idea, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's a public project, but not everyone's seen it. So internally at Red Hat, we, we see stuff like this. You got a bunch of machine names, who, you know, what architecture, who's loaned it out, who's reserved it, this and that. So you, you, know, you can just click on a machine, uh, reserve it, provision whatever install you want. And, and away you go, and you can, it's fantastic for debugging a kernel. Um, you run a bunch of jobs on there, and you get a screen like this. It tells you the, uh, the tests you ran, do they pass? Here's the logs you have, here's the console output, everything you need to, to help you debug or uh, figure out what's going on with the kernel. Uh, and it's got APIs, you can, you can do automation scripts, you can uh, do CLI and bots and stuff too. And the final page I want to show you about Beaker is this is a, if you click on a machine, it has all these details. One of the power of, of, of Beaker is this inventory database. You, put, you plug a machine in the Beaker, you scan it, and it tells you all the pieces about it. It tells you about the CPU, how much memory is in there, how much disk, all the PCI cards and everything. So when you want to run tests, you want to run networking tests, you can get the exact networking card you want. You just do a query to Beaker, and uh, you say, like, I need a you know, 40 gig NIC card, boom. It gives you, it queries its database, figure out which machines have that, give you that, and runs the tests you need. It's, it's amazing. We've been uh, using it, and uh, we've been using it for testing Fedora stuff too now. Uh, so th that's where we start. So we got the hardware. The next thing you need to do is now you need to put tests on top of it. Now Red Hat's bread and butter over the last 15 years for RHEL is the testing aspect. So we have a lot of in-house tests. 
But one of the big pushes we want to do, if we want to stabilize you know, the kernel upstream, we want to build a public ecosystem, we need to start pushing our tests in the public space. So we've been doing that over the last couple of years, and we've, we've pushed out um, a majority of our bigger kernel tests. Uh, so I got, I say 90 public tests. These aren't just small tests. We're talking you know, stuff like LTP, XFS, block tests. These test suites that have hundreds, if not thousands, of tests inside them already. So we've been pushing that upstream, or, or pushing, uh, I guess, a, di a directory that has a glue code into Beaker that uh, can execute these tests for you. Uh, one, another thing we're doing with testing is every change that gets committed upstream, you can't just run all these tests. <laughs> you can't run all the tests on there. It'll take multiple days to do all this stuff. So we have to frame it. One of the things we did early on is frame it to about two to four hours. We, we, we find a set of tests we can do that makes sense for this particular change in the kernel, and we, we reduce it down to two to four hours. And this is in order to handle the volume of change. I mean, 14,000 commits, you, you, you need a, a huge lab to, you need to kind of keep all that parallel testing going. So by framing it, we, it allows us to keep up the volume a little bit. Um, and that requires us to kind of create a new technology called KPAT here, which is dynamic patch detection, or you know, we, we pass in Git trees and kind of allows you to detect what type of which tests map correctly to the patch or the, the source tree that we want to do. Um, and that, you know, we kind of use triggering patterns to, uh, based on code cover to determine exactly the, the files that get touched and what tests they need to trigger. Um, and we also, when we're uh, working with the community on these various tests, we've done reducing false positives. Uh, a lot of times, we, if you want to do a proper CI system, you can't just have a test that passes 90% of the time. It just doesn't make sense. Because uh, now you've got people, 10% of the time, you've got a, a test failure, and you, you, you're telling a, the developer that, hey, your, your, your change failed when it really was a test, and it just gets leads to a frustrating situation. So we're, we're focusing hard on making sure these tests um, reproduce or run reliably. So a lot of the false positive work we've been doing in the last year uh, on these various test suites. Uh, the one thing we haven't done in the public space is workload testing. Um, that's kind of a separate area. <laughs> Um, a lot of it was a proprietary test, but we do workload testing internally, and we, we do provide some of those results upstream, but um, it's not really been the focus of our, our CI ecosystem just yet. Uh, one of the questions I get about testing is, where do I contribute? I have, a, I have a new test, how do I contribute? And at Plumbers last year, we, we, we talked to a bunch of other companies and developers, and they said, LTP is the place to go. If you have a test, you want to contribute to our ecosystem, you want to contribute to stabilizing the upstream kernel, push your test to LTP. If LTP doesn't make sense for you, there's K-self tests. Those are the two biggest things. Now, there's, there's plenty of people who have their own standalone test suites. Um, XFS test is a popular one, block test, whatever. That's fine. We can incorporate that. And in top, in fact, we have this CKI directory right here with test speakers, which is basically a collection of all these test suites. We put um, our little beaker wrapper, this glue code that kind of connects the test suite into our, our, our beaker machine to execute the jobs correctly. So if anyone wants to get involved in this stuff, or if you have a test that you want us to run in our ecosystem, I encourage you, email us at ckiproject.redhat.com. Get involved. We'll, we'll work with you. We'll enable your test. And we'll get it running, and uh, we'll start providing a I guess feedback on that particular uh, subsystem of the kernel. So the next thing is, okay, so now we got hardware, we got tests. How do we put it in, we got an upstream kernel we want to test, or a maintainer's tree. How do we put that together? And that's where, we come, that's where CKI comes in. We have this uh, the CI service, we call it CKI, Continuous Kernel Integration. This is kind of the glue that puts everything together. This is, uh, it, it's basically, it runs in GitLab using pipelines and it's a service, and we just put all the pieces together, and uh, well, it, it runs the automated test, it parses the results, and it emails you the results back to the mailing list or the developer who's interested in these results. Uh, it's, it's a lot more complicated than what I'm, I'm talking about here, and there's a, there's a nice little diagram. They, they gave a CK talk yesterday. It's, it's probably recorded. You can look it up by, by Jakob and Naki, but it does a lot of stuff. There's a lot of triggers. It, it pulls in stuff everywhere, patches from Git trees, Koji, Copper, and everything. But really, this is kind of the, the engine of our CI service, of our ecosystem, that drives all the changes in the testing. Uh, some stats we got going on here. Um, so we've been plugging in. We do a lot of work on uh, 
CKI on Linux stable, ARM, RDMA trees. We find about four to six issues a week. And we're running about up to 90 tests on various subsets of that on, uh, on four different arches. So we've been finding good stuff. Uh, we're looking to expand it. We're trying to get more trees involved, more test suites in there, uh, and expand this stuff. But we're, we're making good progress. We're impacting the community and stuff like that. And again, ckiproject.redhat.com. If you want to get involved, you want to get a Git tree of your own, you're a subsystem maintainer, you want to get a tree involved, contact them. They'll, they'll, they'll hook you up. Uh, more tests, uh, let us know. We'll, uh, we'll get involved. All right, so ARC. ARC is another technology that we've, we've been working on at Red Hat. And what is ARC? ARC is the, the ability to kind of the glue CKI to the kernel developers. What does that mean? So you take an upstream tree, but there's, there's various ways to configure it and package it. And CKI doesn't necessarily know that. So what we need is we need a tree, or so a code base that allows us to do that. So we, we have Fedora kernel and we have always ready kernel. And these have, they provide the configuration, the kernel spec file, the, the packaging rules and stuff like that to CKI to say, okay, based on any Git tree or any patches we have up here, this is how we're gonna connect it, package it so we can run it through our CI system. So it provides all that distro magic. And on top of that, it also, as a side benefit, one of the things we have right now is Fedora is a big fan of Diskit, but it's not a natural way for kernel developers to do development models. So we've been trying to turn it to a source Git model and plug in this distro magic into the embedded, into the source tree. So developers can just hack away like they normally do and then run commands like make RH RPM or something and it, it takes your source tree the way you hacked it up and, convert it to a source RPM and build it locally, or you can send it to our CI service and, and stuff like that. So that's kind of the glue that takes the source code as a developer and plugs you into the CI system. So that's, that's the magic we're doing right there. It, and uh, it's based on technology we've been using to develop RELF for the last 10 years. So it's, it's a stable technology. We're just putting it, pushing it to the Fedora space. Um, a lot of this stuff I've already talked about. Uh, there's a beta link right there. We're, we're, uh, we're slowly pushing that out. Um, Feel free, it's, it's based on GitLab. Feel free to check it out. Uh, any requests or issues, you can contact people there, require uh, file tickets and issues there. Um, okay, so we, that's kind of a, the ecosystem there, but that, that ecosystem, we got hardware, tests, the CI service, the glue code back to developers, that works great in the Red Hat area. One of the problems I want to solve is all the partner labs, all the, the hardware enablement in different labs. So we need to expand onto different labs. So that's where we have a technology called DCI, distributed CI. And this is where it gets involved. This is basically taking all these different labs, you know, either uh, hardware OEMs or hardware enablement. I mean, anyone who makes hardware, take their labs, we can connect it over to the Red Hat labs or the Red Hat ecosystem. And it uses Beaker underneath, so you got Beaker in both places, so it's easy for our CI system to interact with their, with their lab. Now you can't just talk to the D, you can't just talk to their Beaker lab as is, because there's a thing called firewall. But what DCI does, it, it provides a, a public cloud instance where you kind of do the magic, where you kind of push to the cloud and, and pull it back down to the, the lab. So it breaks, it, it's an easy way to get through the firewall, and they set up this unique network lab situation, so it allows us to easily engage in, in these partner labs uh, quickly. And now we have, we're, we're working on technology where we can take any, any change upstream, we can, we can push it into CKI service and it can, it can build in our local uh, Beaker lab and then push out to all our partner labs, get their test results and bring it back to us. And on top of that, we can engage with these partner labs to say, hey look, you wanna run your own tests using um, this system that you can do it on your own term. You do a BIOS update, you can take our test suite run it on your systems independently of us and verify your BIOS or firmware updates isn't breaking anything. So it's a really kind of a cool system that we've been promoting and, and pushing. So uh, there's a website, distributedci.io. I uh, reach out to them, get involved if you're interested in stuff like that. They have a, we have a whole bunch of labs we've set up, so it, you're not gonna be in a unique situation. All right, so uh, we did it. We built an ecosystem, right? We, got, we can manage the hardware, we have tests, we have a CI service, we have glue code for the developers, we can incorporate red, uh, remote labs. This is an ecosystem 
we can put this all together, we can start stabilizing the upstream kernel. Um, and we can get people to interact and, and participate, so that's great. However, <laughs> we're not the first ones this, this, this party. We're not even the second ones. In fact, there's about 400 people who've already been down this road in, in interacting. We have Intel Zero Day, we have Linaro's LKFT, Google Sysbot, we have the kernel CI org effort. So we got a lot of, uh, a lot of people developing their own ecosystem in, in contributing to, to stabilize the upstream kernel. So on the surface, that's fantastic. The more CI systems we tackle the problem, the faster we can stabilize the kernel, everyone happy is a big win, right? No. <laughs> it's not, and the reason why is the developers push back and saying, look, I don't want five different reports from each CI system. I don't want five different ways to plug into your system. I don't, I don't want five different ways to write tests. So uh, <laughs> we failed. Not, not failed, but you know, we created a, a victim of our own success here. So what do we do? The kernel CI org folks decided, you know what? Let's unify this stuff. Let's, let's, let's unite the clans. Let's figure this out. So they, went, they reached out to the Linux Foundation and said, let's start, a, let's start a project. We'll call it the kernel CI project. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll bring a bunch of founding members in there. And we'll have a mission. You know, uh, enhance the quality, stability, and long-term maintenance of the Linux kernel and create an ecosystem that everyone can participate and, and unify over. And they reached out to a bunch of companies and said, hey, let's, let's all get together and try to unify the CI system, make it an easier experience for developers, testers, maintainers, hardware manufacturers, stuff like that. So they reached out to us, and Red Hat's like, yeah, absolutely, we'll be founding members. Um, us, along with Google, Microsoft, SIP, Bay Libra, Calabra, Founders.io, we all collaborated. We said, yeah, this is fantastic. Let's all jump in. Um, and we, 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 that kicked off in November. So we've been spending the last couple months kind of just getting the project going, all the, uh, the business side of things, getting the mission statement straightened up and everything. So now we've gotten to the point, now the business side is stabilized and we got to the point where we're like, okay, what's our, what's our short-term goals? And one of the things we're trying to do is unify reporting methods, encouraging kernel maintainers to utilize CI services and documenting how to plug into all that stuff. Uh, we have been focusing on a, a central database where we aggregate all the, 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 the data into kernelci.org, and then there's a front end that, all the, that can pump all that data back to the maintainers or the data landless stuff. So that's being rolled out. Um, hopefully it'll go live soon, but that's you know, one of the, the early uh, developments of this effort. And on top of that, we're still seeking membership. So if any company out there wants to get involved in defining the standards for the Kernel CI project, or drive the direction of it, I encourage you to get involved. You can reach out to kernelci.org, you can reach out to myself, I'll hook you up with the right people, we can have these conversations. So, a um, couple more slides. This is a, so again, we're all trying to drive towards stabilizing the upstream kernel and using a, an ecosystem sort of like this where you, you kind of put in CI, encourage more testing across various hardwares, more tests and everything, and then if it passes these, these tests and this ecosystem, push it upstream. Because you know, fixing a change before it's committed is far easier than after it's released. So this is the effort we're doing. Um, I encourage everyone who wants to participate, reach out. We're building this, we're, we're driving, we're trying to grow it. Um, I gave you all these links. Uh, if you're not sure what to do, just reach out. We're happy to guide you, steer you, do anything to uh, get you going, you know, whether if you're a developer, maintainer, hardware manufacturer, tester, whatever. We're happy to, uh, happy to get involved with you. So that's all I have. I know I'm really short on time. Um, here's some links. Um, summary of all the links I showed you before. Uh, I guess last thing is questions. I know it's a little fast there, but we're kind of short on time. Nothing? Someone's got to give me one question. <laughs> I got Neil. Thanks. So, just spitballing here, but in several of your slides, you, you noted that, that we've got this distributed CI system whereby we, we incorporate labs from multiple vendors. Um, one of the interesting things I think I was thinking about while you were presenting that was a lot of these, these labs were established to, to test a specific distribution's code, i.e., you know, B 
speakers set up to test RHEL. We, we can test ARC, of course, or, or anything we want, but we invested in it to test RHEL. SUSE did the same thing, Canonical, the yep. same thing, what have you. Have you considered the possibility of a correlating results database that, that allowed individual distributions to, to test their own distributions and submit results based on information regarding the test they submitted, the, the errors they may have found, and what code they incorporated from upstream so that they'd be more likely to use it? Yes, so the question is, um, I'm gonna summarize it a little bit. It's, obviously this is from a Red Hat perspective of the ecosystem using Beaker and testing in a, in a partner lab, but if other distributions wanna participate, run their tests, how do we aggregate their data, right? I think. Uh, so that's what the kernel CI org project is trying to do. We're trying to centralize that data, trying to get, okay, all the dis different distributions are running their data, let's, let's put it to a central database and we'll get someone to parse that data, analyze that data, um, and, and see if there's any difference here, discrepancies. Hopefully all, that, all these testing is passing, but if one distribution is failing, another one's passing, how do we dissect, you know, bisect it and, and figure out what's going on there? Uh, and we're also trying to figure out ways to encourage Beaker and other uh, systems out like Beaker, like LKFT, to expand across uh, different distributions. That way, more people can contribute. It's easier for hardware manufacturers to get different distributions inside their labs. I am out of time. Uh, maybe I can sneak one more question in. No? No. Yes? No. No, I mean, kicked <laughs> off. Uh, I did that on purpose, right? No. Um, thank you, everybody. I uh, hope you learned something.